Good morning, and welcome again to Worship at Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. Apparently, Facebook did not want to accept our live feed, so we're coming to you through YouTube and then linking that back over to Facebook. So hopefully, um, you are staying with us, and uh, I invite you again to make comments or share this link and let people know that we are here and we are worshiping together. If you have... Uh, printed out the order of worship that was in your worship resource email, feel free to join in on any of the bold, sing along to the songs, and uh, just enjoy fully this time together. After the service today, there'll be two options to continue in a time of fellowship with one another. Um, Java and Jesus uh, will start at 11 o'clock, as will uh, a virtual coffee hour. Both of these will have Zoom links that you'll find in that worship resource email. A reminder that July 12th, in just two weeks, we will be having a candidating Sunday for our new senior pastor, followed by a congregational meeting and vote. So please make sure that you tune in for that, um, that service. Also, uh, starting this week on Tuesday, June 30th, there will be free COVID testing in our parking lot from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. It will run Tuesday through Friday. Uh, any, everyone is encouraged to get tested so that we can um, help public health have a better understanding of the prevalence of the virus in our community. A reminder that the compassion offering for, Zoom, for the month of June is the Interfaith Voter Engagement Project. This is the last Sunday of June, so we invite you if you have uh, planning to make a donation to that, uh, that project that you do that today. And then the next thing up is a video from the search committee from Kim Casper. After the video, Ree and Peter uh, will lead us into worship. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kim Casper, and I'm here as a representative of our Senior Pastor Search Committee. We'd like to share with you a little bit more about the Reverend Dr. Julia Berkey, another quality that helped us to know she was our candidate. I'm gonna to read to you some words that I've written. Through our listening sessions and small group meetings when we first began our search, you all helped us identify characteristics we would value in a new senior pastor someone who is caring, compassionate, and welcoming, someone who is approachable, supportive, and encouraging, someone who listens with a non-anxious presence, someone who will nurture our gifts and who will help us become our best selves, someone who has lived these ideals and wants to continue exploring them personally as a leader of our congregation. We group these characteristics together as the trait of open-heartedness. Julia's open-heartedness was apparent in her profile. Her words and her voice were immediately intriguing, filled with creative, fresh, and vibrant images. Her writing and her outlook were grounded in joy and in hope as she described practicing ministry through fun and the arts and through humility and justice. She wrote of finding healing in the fullness of our human experience, in our joy and in our grief. As she described her faith journey and her ministry, she told of a story that was being lived into. Our committee dared to wonder, might she be who we've been searching for? Our first meeting was a Skype interview our chair, Sarah Roberts, greeted Julia and explained there were seven other members present who would introduce themselves and ask questions. Julia's immediate response to Sarah was, might each person tell me a little about themselves when they introduce themselves? Her first priority was to get to know us. Later, she led us in prayer, inviting us to center ourselves she asked for a blessing for each one of us by name. And she prayed that we might all be blessed by God's work in the world. Then she went on to answer a whole host of questions with warmth, openness, and composure. 
When the Skype ended, a committee sat quietly. We now dared to see God's hand guiding us closer. At our in-person interview, Julia opened her hands to receive our words. At one point during the interview, Julia asked each of us to share one memory or quality we most cherish about ORUCC. By her presence, the way she pays attention, the way she affirms without a need to fix, the way she holds space, I felt I was being ministered to. Later, Barbara Stretchberry shared that during our sharing, she had noticed Julia had sat the whole time with open hands to hold our cherished words. This was a job interview, but it was also a holy moment. In getting to know Julia, I believe you will find her to be gentle and kind in word and movement with an inner beauty that draws you in. She pays attention with her entire body, with the inner grace of a dancer and of one who lives in awe. She embraces mystery. She engages through the transformative power of story. She's always listening and reflecting, and she remembers little details you share and circles back to check in. One reference shared with us that Julia lives out of a faithfulness that points us toward hope and grace, while also honoring the complexities and pain and dissent in the world. I'm impressed with how caring and thoughtful Julia is being in her goodbyes with her current church. She's eager to meet us and to know us and to learn about our personal faith, our church, our lives. Open-heartedness is but one reason our search committee unanimously, confidently, delightedly, and excitedly nominates the Reverend Dr. Julia Berkey to become the next senior pastor of Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. Psalm 13, Contemporary English Bible. How long will you forget me, Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I be left to my own wits, agony filling my heart, daily? How long will my enemy keep defeating me? Look at me, answer me, Lord my God. Restore sight to my eyes, otherwise I'll sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, I won. My foes will rejoice over my downfall, for I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. Yes, I will sing to the Lord, because he has been good to me. Let us pray together. In, In this time, time of worship, worship help me, God, to remember all the ways that you have been good, good to me. How in the midst of my doubts and life's chaos, you have been there, watching over me, gently guiding me. Blessed are all those who place their trust in you, for it shall be well with their souls. Amen. And now we will uh, listen to Josie Gilbert read a story for all ages, because nothing looks like God. Good morning, I'm Josie, and I'm reading Because Nothing Looks Like God by Lawrence Kushner and Karen Kushner. Where is God? God is in the beginning, in the first red ripening tomato, and in cookies fresh from the oven, in the first fun day of vacation, and in the tiny hands of a baby. Where is God? God is in the end, in the last sweet bite of birthday cake, and in your worn, torn baby blanket, in the last wave goodbye at the end of a visit in the closing moments of someone's life. Where is God? God is in the way people come together, 
in the sharing of a cold and gloomy morning, and in the band-aid fix-up after a fall, in homemade gifts made of clay and paint, and in morning hugs and goodnight kisses. Where is God? God is in the world, in bird chirp, frog song, and chattering squirrels, and in the fly caught in the spider's web, in caterpillars chewing leaves from daisies, and in worms turning leaves into earth. Where is God? God is everywhere, if only we look. God is everywhere if we let God in. What does God look like? God looks like nothing, and nothing looks like God. But there are many things you cannot see, and we are still sure that they are there. Like cool breezes on a hot summer night, or the rays of the sun drying puddles of rain. Like the long hours until supper time, or the short minutes of a day at the beach. You know they're there, but there is nothing to see. Like the kindness in someone's voice, or the happiness in a song. Like the pride when mom or dad helps you in your class, or the jumpy excitement at the start of a holiday. You know it's there, but there is nothing to see. Like the love your mom adds to your goodnight story, or your dad's hooray when you first tie your shoes. Like the, your hope when it's your turn at bat, or the worry when your dog runs away. You know it's there, but there's nothing to see. God doesn't look like anything either, because there's nothing to see. But everyone and everything gives us clues that God is here. Clues that point to the one we cannot see. How does God make things happen? Look at your family. See sisters taking turns on a slide and brothers sharing a new game. Watch how everyone comes together to help with dinner. How does God make things happen? at your school. A boy helps when another can't reach. A girl shares her lunch. Watch how everyone shows the swings to a new friend. How does God make things happen? Look at your town. One family gives money for the people who lost their home. A neighborhood gathers books for children in the hospital. Watch how everyone helps a family with a new baby. How does God make things happen? Look in the mirror. Can you visit someone who feels lonely? Or pick up trash in the playground? Can you and your friends collect toys for children who have none? How does God make things happen? with little hands and big hands, with young hands and old hands, with your hands. One of the places where God is found in this community is in its music. Today, we have a special thank you to our adult choir for all of the gifts of music that they share. Um, please enjoy this video from, uh, with a song that they sang in uh, January of this year as a thank you to them.
A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Some time afterward, God put Abraham to the test. He said to him, Abraham, and he answered, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your favorite one, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering, and he set out for the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place from, af from afar. Then Abraham said to his servants, You stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go up there. We will worship, and we will return to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son Isaac. He himself took the firestone and the knife, and the two walked off together. Then Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he answered, Here am I, my son. And he said, Here is the firestone and the wood, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will see to the sheep for his burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place of which God had told them. Abraham built an altar there. He laid out the wood. He bound his son Isaac. He laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to slay his son. Then an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, Do not raise your hand against the boy, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your favored one, from me. When Abraham looked up, his eyes fell upon a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that site, The Lord Sees. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord there is vision. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, My, By myself I swear, the Lord declares, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your favored one, I will bestow my blessing upon you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sands on the seashore. And your descendants shall seize the gates of their foes. All the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your descendants because you have obeyed my command. This, this is, is the, the witness, witness of the, of the people, people of, of God. God.
pray with me? Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I will admit to a certain fascination with today's text. I have long been a consumer of horror fiction. Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Clive Barker, Mary Shelley, Peter Straub, Shirley Jackson, Edgar Allan Poe. My all-time favorite character, Sir Anthony Hopkins' portrayal of Hannibal Lecter in Jonathan Demme's film The Silence of the Lambs, a brilliant adaptation of a very mediocre novel by Thomas Harris. From a literary standpoint, the story of a fanatical father who takes his son up a mountain to slaughter him is a probable foundation for such a horror novel. But why is this story in our Bible? And why does it hold claim to our theological imagination? What does it mean to teach us about God or about ourselves? It is a story that is shared by all three Abrahamic faiths, with Islam substituting Ishmael for Isaac as the son who was spared sacrifice. In Judaism, it is the story read on Rosh Hashanah, the highest of the high holy days. The shofar, the ram's horn, blown on that holiday is said to be a reminder of the akedah, the binding, and how Isaac was spared. Christians see in Isaac the archetype of Jesus, the beloved son who is to be sacrificed. Taken at face value, this is a horrific story. We are rightly uncomfortable with the image of a God who would demand such a sacrifice. One of the things I most valued about the class I took this last year in Judaism is that taking scripture at face value is not the Jewish way. There's no need to find the truth of a text. Arguing with the text to find meaning for today's context, disagreeing with it is necessary and encouraged. One rabbi said, we are Yisrael, the people who wrestle with God and with our sacred text. Wrestling with the text means looking critically at what is there and what isn't asking what is going on in the gaps of the story and in the heads of the actors. Judaism has a rich tradition of midrash that seeks to fill in these gaps and creating dialogues between the characters. One tradition says that Abraham knew all that he wouldn't go through with the killing of Isaac. When he and Isaac and the two servants arrive at the site, Abraham tells his servants to stay with the donkeys while he and his son ascend the mountain. He assures them, we will worship and we will return to you. Now, if Abraham knew he wouldn't go to and presumably God never really wanted him to do it anyway, then why bother with this whole charade in the first place? The Midrash suggests that this is the divine answer. For now I know that you are one who fears God. Now God not only knows, but God has indisputable proof, indisputable proof of Abraham's faithfulness. Proof to show the world's doubters that Abraham is worthy of God's special election and covenant. And by extension, so are all of Abraham's descendants. The test, perhaps, wasn't for God's benefit, but ours, for the generations to come after Abraham. Another tradition looks at the three-day gap in time Abraham and company travel to this place that God will show him, the mountain upon which the sacrifice will take place. What happened in those three days? The rabbis can't resist imagining, imagining Abraham's difficult internal journey, creating a dialogue between Abraham and Satan, known as the adversary. Satan asked him, where are you going? Abraham replied, to pray. Said he, Abraham, was I not there when the Holy One did say to you, take thy son? 
There's no way you'd take a son vouchsafed for you at the age of a hundred. Abraham replied, just for this. Satan said, and if he tries you more than this, can you withstand it? Said Abraham, and more. The Satan retorted, tomorrow he will call you a shedder of blood. Abraham replied, just for this. Rabbi Lydia Medwin, director of congregational engagement and outreach at the temple in Atlanta writes, when we read this dialogue as a metaphor for the internal struggle that might accompany any of us through a tough decision, we find the true difficulty that comes in the wake of the decision. Abraham tries to lie to himself about his true purpose only to call himself back into the truth of his, his decision. He feels pulled by his fatherly love, his desire for an heir, and the voice of his conscience. The challenge is not in simply deciding to act in a moment of ambiguity. It is all the self-doubt, the questioning that happens during the course of the journey. This glimpse at Abraham's internal dialogue struggle is helpful because with it, we can stop trying to make this story into something beautiful and uplifting, because it's not. Instead, we can simply weep. Weep for all the tragic injustices and ethical decisions in our lives, and weep for the horrible choices people feel they have to make. In our time, we can weep for refugees making decisions to flee with their families, embarking on perilous journeys in hope of a better life. We can weep for people being sacrificed by the relentless injustices of racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia. We can weep for children being sacrificed and exploited by neglect, bullying, violence, abuse, poverty, homelessness, hunger, child labor, and prostitution. We can weep for a planet being ravaged by disease, Natural, natural disasters, climate change, and war. Strangely, what this horrible story does is offer us some tools for navigating the horrors of our own, of COVID, of Black Lives Matter, of climate change, of a global refugee crisis, of political polarization. We are taught to see the ram as the miracle that God provides at the last minute to spare the life of Isaac. But the ram has been there all along. The ram didn't just wander in at the last minute, but was stuck in the thicket by his thorns. The miracle is that Abraham eyes to see the ram. He lifted his eyes to see a better choice that was already there, to see a way of life where there had previously been only death. Abraham's heart was chained. That's the real miracle. His spiritual understanding of God was changed. The one God was not like everyone else's gods. The one God did not require the sacrifice of children. The one God can be found wherever children are endangered. I want to believe that Isaac too learned that to be chosen meant to redirect your hands away from violence to one another, to instead trust that God will provide a path toward life. Living an ethical life is complicated. We may think that we would stand up to bullies, speak out against injustice, or make the tough ethical decision, even if it were to affect those we love. But we don't really know until we are with a truly difficult choice. It is in these difficult, gut-wrenching choices to live by our values where these are the places where everyday miracles happen. Think of the dying person who finds peace in the faith that their loved ones will carry on her values. Think of the addict who, after years of struggle, finds the strength to choose sobriety. Think of the workaholic who realizes that time with family is a truer treasure than overtime pay. Think of the friendships and marriages that have been reconciled when both parties choose forgiveness over 
pride or nursing a grudge. Think of the person with juicy but destructive gossip just on the tip of their tongue, who yet refrains from the momentary pleasure of tearing someone else down. These are all examples of everyday miracles, but in some way, these are easy examples, decisions that can be true in any time or place. Let me push further into this moment that is ripe for other kinds of miracles. Think of the millions of white people newly engaged in learning the racial history of our nation, refusing to look away from the history of racial injustice and committing to undoing systems of racial oppression. Think of the police officers, judges, attorneys, social workers, and government leaders willing to move beyond the slogans and engage in dialogue around reimagining a community response to safety and criminal justice based on a restorative justice model. What would it take to expand this movement into your circle of influence? For business leaders, bankers, real estate agents, health professionals, legislators, parents, teachers, all to work to dismantle systems of discrimination for black and brown people, for First Nation people, for poor people, for LGBTQ people, and for people of all physical, mental, and developmental abilities. What would it take to fully embrace our calling as the call that was first given to Abraham, that his descendants were to be a blessing to all people, all nations, all creation. The power of this story is the mirror it holds up to all of us who would claim a relationship with God. We are Abraham. We hold the knife. God does not want the sacrifice of God's children, but perhaps this is a test. What proof can we give that we are worthy to be called Abraham's descendants? Amen. In the time of prayer, I invite you to sing along in our prayers. We turn now to a time of prayer with joys for our National United Church of Christ Open and Affirming Sunday today, celebrating the lives of LGBTQ people, their families, their allies, and the rights they have gained. We give joy for Reverend Dr. Dr. Julia Berkey, who will be candidating for the senior pastor position on July 12th. For Angie Shonick's many hours of volunteer service, working with Margie Dupuy in creating a new website for us. For the members of our pictorial directory mission team, 
who are waiting patiently to receive bios and pictures from all of us who belong to the church. And for the members of our racial justice mission team who are helping to move us forward in dismantling racism. Come, Lord, bring to us your peace. Let us rejoice before you with a perfect heart. Continuing prayers of joy for ORUCC members Reed Hale and Peter Fabian, who will be moving to Boston Spa, New York in early July, for all the many gifts they've shared with our congregation for so many years. For a successful Juneteenth Facebook fundraiser for Brian Stevenson's organization, Equal Justice Initiative, over $900 was raised on that fundraiser. For the money raised through our attendance at the Just Mercy movie, $200 will be donated to the Equal Justice Initiative and $200 locally to the Nehemiah Foundation. We give joy for family vacations and for the grace to forgive, the composure to react calmly, and the decision to breathe through every aggravation, irritation, and difficulty. Come, Lord, bring to us your peace. Let us rejoice before you with grateful heart. Now we bring before God our prayers of concern. For a friend of Kathy Borkowski, 18-year-old Althea Bernstein, who was driving in Madison last Tuesday night and was at a stop site, stoplight with the windows rolled down when four white men came up, called her the N-word, and threw lighter fluid on her, followed by a lit lighter. She suffered second and third degree burns. We pray for Peggy Anderson, whose husband Norm died yesterday, for Norm and Peggy's extended families as they grieve. We pray for a former member of our church, Helen Atz, who is in hospice for lung cancer. We pray for continued efforts to dismantle racism and white supremacy. And we pray for the family of Jack Shire's friend, Jim Harrington, who died on Tuesday, June 23rd. Come, Lord, bring to us your peace. Let us rejoice before you with thankful heart. Our dear Abba in heaven, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the test, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'd now like to take a few moments to honor Ree and Peter and say farewell to them. And I would invite you to take a look at your printed uh, worship bulletin. At the conclusion of our tribute to Ree and Peter, we'll invite you to uh, share in a Celtic blessing that you'll find in the bulletin. So at this point in our service, we would like to say farewell to two among us who have been very, very special friends to us wonderful members of our church for many, many years, 
Peter Fabian and Ree Hale. And I'd like to ask Peter and Ree to share with us now um, what's ahead of you. Well, we will be moving to New York State to the community called Boston Spa. And it's where many members of my family live and have lived for generations. So we'll be um, leaving here early in July when they get the rest of the house packed and uh, traveling for two and a half, three days to get there. We've also found a new church that we'll be uh, glad to become part of. We checked them out when we were there visiting for Thanksgiving. And it's a UCC church up in Saratoga. We walked in and saw rainbow banners and open and affirming and a safe sanctuary type of congregation. And it was after the service, we were at the uh, Friendship Hour and one of the members came up and said to us, you do have to know we're kind of a weird church. <laughs> and we both thought, are kind of weird. <laughs> and they have a prayer show ministry as well. Peter and Ree, we're just so uh, grateful for our many years of serving together with you and uh, you have shared so many gifts with us and um, the two of you are both ordained UCC pastors. You've served a number of congregations uh, as pastors called clergy and then also as interim clergy. But here at Orchard Ridge, uh, Ree, you served on staff with us um, as associate pastor and uh, you have just done so many various things in the life of this church, introducing us to dining out groups and uh, coordinating over 55. And uh, I think most people will always remember you for your wonderful contribution in giving leadership to the prayer shawl ministry. And you, or you yourself, I can't even imagine how many prayer shawls you have knitted over the years. Uh, thank you, Ree, for all those wonderful gifts you've shared with us. Uh, another one I left out is your work in liturgical arts. So Ree and Karen Faulkner together would dress the communion table so beautifully during uh, the seasons of Lent and Advent. So we're going to miss you for all of those things. Peter, you have just shared so many gifts with us in so many different areas. Ushering, what a wonderful gift of hospitality you have given us. Uh, preparing and cleaning up after communion, serving communion for so many years. Sharing your musical gifts, teaching in our adult education program. I'll never forget that uh, series that you did on family systems theory. So thank you for sharing all those great gifts with us. Tammy has a couple of memories also. Well, Rhea and I started at the same time here as interim pastors in 2007, but I knew Rhea before that because of her ministry in the wider uh, community here. And so it was just really lovely to spend two and a half years working with Rhea here on the staff and supporting each other and uh, just enjoying the creativity that uh, Ree brings and ideas was just lovely. I also want to credit Ree with introducing our family to Moon Beach. Um, she convinced our yes. family <laughs> to go there in 2007 and when our kids were three and five and, and there's no going back. I mean, there is going back every year <laughs> since then. And uh, if it wasn't for Ree's support and just encouragement and nudge, um, we may not have gone that year or who knows. But, um, and it's become just a lovely sacred place for our family. And I'm just so deeply appreciative of all of Ree's work on the UCCI board and working in the uh, ministries with the camps throughout the years. Just a wonderful um, advocate for our incredible church uh, camp ministry. And I'm gonna just miss Peter too for his uh, family systems information and, and he knows I've shared that uh, love as well. And, uh, and I've always just felt so wonderful when I saw Peter in the kitchen getting communion prepared. And just your presence among us really has meant a lot and I think has ministered to a lot of people. So God bless you both. And I know Laura has a final uh, blessing for you. So we extend our hands around you, metaphorically, <laughs> in this time. Mm -hmm. And I have a Celtic blessing for today. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of God's hand.
Amen. Amen. And now as we prepare to go out of this service, I invite you all to sing, I'm going to live so God can use me. We will sing three verses. I'm gonna sing a song. 